And just to verify that you're still seeing the screen that has the stories of faith and not Facebook. Correct. Welcome to Stories of Faith, from Jerusalem to New York City. My name is Samar Ali, and I'm the president and CEO of Millions of Conversations. And I'm excited to introduce this event to you today, the story exchange in partnership between Millions of Conversations and Narrative 4. Millions of Conversations transcends divides by uniting Americans around common values for a shared future. We do this in a number of different ways, including by building empathy and sharing stories as we're going to be doing tonight with our partner, Narrative 4. At Millions of Conversations, we aim to disrupt cycles of fear, hate, and violence. We do this by building empathy. We do this by changing toxic narratives that demonize the other and challenging disinformation and misinformation campaigns. Millions of Conversations, we aim to rebuild the public square to renew a social contract that brings us together around commonly shared values and to work together to undivide America. We look forward and always towards creating content, both online and offline, that changes demonizing narratives, that humanizes people and brings people together in conversation so that we can humanize, build, and play together in ways that work for all of us. Without further ado, I'm excited to introduce Greg Khalil, who is our partner in peace. Uh, he is the president and CEO of Telos and also the chairman and co-founder of Narrative4. Greg, over to you. Samar, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yes, I serve on the board of Narrative4, not the co-founder, um, but with the, <laughs> just a slight correction there. But um, Narrative4 is an amazing global organization that seeks to harness the power of story exchange, which we're about to demonstrate for you, to equip young people around the world to harness their own potential, their communities, um, and ultimately transform this broken place that we all share. Um, it's an amazing organization. I'll let um, Katie and Kareem speak more into that. 
Um, I'm here in New York City. I'm speaking from my apartment. Uh, as Samar mentioned, the way that we know each other through, is through another organization that I founded and run called Telos. And Telos is in a similar space. We work um, on equipping people uh, to become peacemakers, to confront seemingly intractable issues of our, our age. And we have focused on a few issues most uh, meaningfully for this call is the relationship of the US to the Middle East and specifically Israel-Palestine and moving that conversation into a direction that focuses more on fundamental human rights rather on than political interests. So um, I'm really excited to be here. And I think Katie, you're up next. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie Stumbo. Um, I am the current chair for the Narrative for Student Ambassador Group called the Globe Trotters. Um, and I'll be talking a little bit about what the goal of the story exchange is, and then I'll throw it over to Kareem to explain the process of the story exchange. Um, so the goal of the story exchange is to really derive empathy from each other. And um, empathy, for those of you that may not be completely sure what that means, is basically you come into like a mutual understanding. You're understanding where their story is coming from and why they feel the way they do about a certain um, thing. And the beauty of Narrative 4 is we're not here to try to change your minds about certain topics or anything like that. We're, there to, we're here to simply listen and come to that mutual ground of understanding. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to throw it over to Kareem to go ahead and talk a little bit about the story exchange process. Hello, my name is Kareem Ajid, and I am a student ambassador for Narrative 4 from the Bronx. So a story exchange is when you and another person share a story and take in what the other person has told you and also for your partner to take in what you have told them. You then share the same story about the, what your partner has told you, but from their perspective. For example, let's say Samara is my partner. I would say, my name is Samara Lee and this is my story and then continue on and you share the story. Great. So thank you all. And I should also note, uh, I failed to say where I'm speaking from. I'm coming to you live from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so uh, just bordering you, Katie, um, you're, you're, you're on the northern border there. Um, so without further ado, let's kick it off and let's get into our story exchange. We're first going to hear um, from Greg and Katie. They will do their story exchange first and then Kareem and I will go next. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Katie Stumbo, and I was born and raised in Floyd, Kentucky, in Eastern Kentucky, as you probably figured out by my accent. Um, I'm a junior in college uh, at Moorhead College, um, and I just love school. I love my life. I love my community. But I want to tell you a story about how I learned to appreciate and love the various different parts of myself and my community that always don't seem to fit, including my faith. So as I mentioned, I grew up in Floyd County in a very conservative Southern Baptist church. And so you may have heard about the Southern Baptist denomination, evangelical de denomination, um, which is often associated rightly sometimes and wrongly sometimes with some of the culture wars that we see um, in, our, in our community. And my, my nana and papa, my grandparents, they basically raised me. I have a good relationship with my parents, but these were the real figures in my life. And the place where we really became close was Sunday at church. They took me every Sunday and it was a big part of our lives during the week. And that's just a place where I feel most at home and with that. So fast forward a number of years, um, you know, church had been a big part of my life. I'd grown up, my politics didn't really align necessarily with everybody in church or what I thought they believed. I tended to be a lot more progressive. And I really, you know, other place I really loved was school. I just love studying. I love learning. I love connecting with people. And so I did really well in school. I don't mean to brag but I will. Um, and so I started to go to college um, in a college program here at Moorhead in my junior year of college called the Craft Academy. So I started taking college courses instead of high school courses. And I went away for this retreat. And there was this, there was this man, this boy, a little younger than me. I was 16 at the time. And he had this hot pink hair and he was just really dynamic. And we just connected. His name is Caden. And let me tell you, like we just connected like we were just 
we were twins. I mean, there was this energy among us. Like we laughed at the same jokes. We liked all the same things. We just, we just got each other in a way that never happens. And just so quickly, this person, Caden, became my closest friend. And Caden um, happens to be gay. Um, and so, you know, I didn't really think anything of it because like that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything to me, but now he was becoming such a big part of my life. I was going home for the weekend and I wanted Caden to come with me like any friend would. And I, I love to ride horses and go four wheeling. And like, I know Caden loves those things too. So I wanted to come out, you know, meet my family, hang out. And so I invited him out and then I started getting a little nervous because I was like, oh, wait a second. Um, what if my parents, what if my Nana and Papa, like, what if they don't accept him? What if they make him feel weird? I don't want him to feel diminished because of my family. Um, and I don't want to hurt him. And I also don't want my family to think that way about people that I, I love. Like, I didn't, I just felt really conflicted about what was going to happen. So long story short, I, I finally said, like, you know, I need to learn this lesson about not caring what other people think. And I talked to Kenan about it. And he was okay coming. And so he came out for the weekend and um, we were having a really good time, but it was also really important to me to go home, like with Nana and Papa to church. And I hadn't been with them for so long and I know how important it is for them. And so I really wanted to do this and I talked to Caden about it and I wanted him to come if he was okay. I said he didn't have to, um, of course. And, um, and he said, okay, like he would do it, but he had some issues because he's from Northern Kentucky and he had a real issue in his church where they called him the F word and basically kicked him out. And he just didn't want to have anything to do with that again, but he wanted to see my life and, 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 and try with me. So, um, so he said, okay. And, and I was really nervous and, you know, cause I know how people talk and I knew people would know who he is because I post on social media a lot on Instagram. So I had pictures with me and him and his boyfriend and his pink hair. And so like, it wasn't, there, there was no hiding this. Everybody was going to know. So we were leaving, you know, to church and I pulled my, my Nana aside and I said, look, Nana, I, I have to let you know if anybody says anything, no offense to you, but we're out of there. I can't put him through this. And she was like, don't worry, don't worry. So we showed up and we started the worship service and I noticed people were noticing us and I was really nervous and we were just having a good, I mean, it was a meaningful experience for me and nobody was doing anything, um, you know, inappropriate. Um, and finally, the, the, the service ended and, um, and we went to sort of the congregational fellowship part and people started coming up to us. The pastor shook his hand and welcomed him. And I was, I was getting really a little nervous, but people were, you know, coming up to me and there, there, there were a few women in church who like to say what's on their mind, like all the time. And they were really nervous. You know, I was really nervous about them, but they came up and hugged him and said, welcome. And then, then another woman came up. And she said to me, wait, is this the, the, this the boy from social media? And my heart dropped for a second because I, I thought like there was, and, and no, in fact, and I, I said, yes, I, I told the truth. And she said, oh, it's so nice to see young love. And I couldn't believe like this was happening in my own community. I mean, I know there are people who have different views about this, but I started to see just as I had a complex relationship to my faith and I was very much rooted in that place in that home, the story was larger there and other people had different views and everybody welcomed Caden in so much so that he said, if church was like this everywhere, I'd want to go. He's not a, he's not a believer like me, but um, it was nice to know that he could feel welcome in my, in my home, in my space. And since that time, like I started to really feel a deeper connection to my faith and what it could be, which is expressing love for God and other people without discrimination um, and just with true and close inclusivity and welcomeness. And for me, now I'm not embarrassed to talk about my faith publicly anymore. And um, Caden and I, this was a number of years ago, we're still best friends. He's been to my house at least 50 times since. He's come back to church with me. I'm to his house every other weekend. And so it's just that story, that, that moment where I felt that all of these things that I am and all of the people that I could love could be in one place together and I could embrace all of it. So I'm Katie Stumbo from Floyd, Kentucky, and that's my story. Thank you so much, Katie, for sharing that story. Um, hi, my name is Greg Khalil, and today I'm gonna to be telling you about one of my numerous trips to Jerusalem. Um, so before I get into my story, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of background information about myself. Um, so 
my dad is actually from Jerusalem. Like when he was younger, he lived in a house that my great, great, great grandfather built up when um, he was younger. And um, after he was born there and he met my mom and everything, we moved to San Diego, California, which is where I'm from. Um, you can clearly tell by the accent. Um, and we grew up in, or I grew up in a very religious home. So like I grew up as a Greek Orthodox Christian um, and also as a Palestinian. Um, although my dad and I had moved from, you know, uh, or although my dad had moved and brought up his life here in, you know, California, um, we still had connections to our family back home in um, Bethlehem. So basically what happens is I travel back and forth a lot. And so um, in the year of 1998, I actually had the opportunity to go travel back home for Easter and see some of my family. Um, so I was really nervous the first few times I ever went to Jerusalem because I was really nervous about being, you know, questioned about my faith. I was nervous about people saying, oh, are you Muslim? Or, oh, when did you convert to Christianity? And, and you know, I had never converted because I'd just grown up as a Greek Orthodox Christian, you know? And so basically what happened was I went to visit my family during Easter of 1998. And um, we went to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And basically what that is, is that's the church that surrounds the tomb of Jesus. Um, so obviously that the empty tombs there and everything. And during Easter, people from all around the world, you know, traveled to this location um, to come in for the Holy Flame Ceremony, which is basically where they light a candle and they literally send it all around the world to other, you know, um, Orthodox communities across the globe. So me and my cousin George um, decided we were going to go this year and decided that we were willing to fight the crowd. Um, we were already running a little bit late, um, just, you know, it started at like a certain time and we were already, you know, a few hours behind schedule. Um, and so in Palestine and in that area, I was able to freely go through because I was American. But my cousin George, however, um, cause well, he, where he was native to the land, he had to like kind of sneak his way around um, security to get his, into the, um, the place where the actual holy flame ceremony is. So, um, we finally, we both sneak through, we meet up on the other end, and we look at the line for the Greek Orthodox, and it was so long, we were like, there's no way we'd get in. So, I decided we were just going to get in the Armenian um, Christian line. So, we got there, and looking at me, like, everybody around could tell that I, we definitely weren't Armenian Christian. Um, so, the man in front of me turns around, he said, are you Armenian? And I was like, no, <laughs> like, I mean, I couldn't really hide it. Um, and so he started causing this huge fuss. And then basically like this big battle brawl, like breaks out in the line. Like people start pushing each other. People start, you know, just absolutely going at it. And finally a security guard came over and he uses this huge great, so like this huge bar thing and pushes me like, back trying uses me as like a human shield against the crowd he pushes me into the crowd and like it started pushing me so hard that like I couldn't breathe and like my shirt got ripped and he just kept pushing and I remember there was this lady she was using like she was um I don't know the proper term for it but she was like making rotisserie chicken and I was so scared like I was scared that they were gonna hurt her and like I was already getting hurt like he used me as a battering ram like it was not a fun time um and so basically, finally, the crowd like calms back down after, you know, everybody's been pushed this way, that way and another. But eventually what happens is we just get out of the line. We're like, all right, we've caused enough chaos here. Let's get out of the line. So my cousin actually had a bishop friend who was able to actually sneak us in the back door. Um, so we were able to still show up to the ceremony, which was very nice. Um, and so we finally got in we got to see the you know the lighting ceremony of the holy flame and basically what they do with that is they have like these certain types of containers where after the candles lit they'll light other candles from the holy flame um of god and they'll just send it you know to every corner of the world to different communities um and just also a little bit more background like my family like growing up was super religious and i'll but i always felt like kind of uncomfortable with my faith. Like, I didn't really know where I stood with it. Um, but due to the events that I saw this day, 
it was so awesome just to see pilgrims from across the globe come to see the holy flame um because you know no matter what religion you are whether you know you're orthodox jew orthodox you know christian or armenian christian like people from all around the globe some of which that like had saved their life savings to come see this moment it was just really a beautiful thing to see people believe in something bigger than themselves and like really take the responsibility and realize that there's a source of goodness out there but you know to find that source of goodness they have to look for something bigger than themselves so thank you so much um that's my story that was great yeah thank you greg and katie that was that was powerful and I, I can't wait till after we tell our, uh, Kareem and I do our story exchange for us to hear a little bit about um, how experiencing each other's stories went and also the questions that we'll be taking from the audience. So um, everyone hold your questions that you might have for Greg and Katie, because Kareem and I are gonna go next and do our story exchange. Um, and then we're gonna talk about what it was like to do this, to learn about each other, to build empathy um, with each other, um, especially virtually and across Zoom. And then we're gonna be opening it up for questions. Okay, Kareem. All right. We're summer. <laughs> Hello, my name is Samar Ali, and this is the story about a time I experienced violence in my life. After spending quite a time outside of the United States, I came back to Washington, D.C., where I live. When I returned back home, I realized something was wrong, that the thing was that people felt I wasn't an American, that I was an inside threat for the government. Therefore, people led hate campaigns towards me. These campaigns included a billboard that were targeting me and threatening me. On the billboard, these people were calling me a terrorist and associating me with violence. My life was being threatened by people just because of my race, religion, and background. I couldn't believe some people wanted me dead because of who I am. One day, I ended up meeting a lady who was one of the people who thought wrongfully about me. She was also someone who pushed for the billboard to be up. I ended up having coffee with her and had a conversation that led to her changing her perspective on who I was as a person. She has changed her mind about who I was and I hope no one doesn't have to judge anyone else by their race, religion, and background. My name is Samara Lee and this is a story about a time I experienced violence in my life. And hello again, my name is Samara Ali, and this is the story about an obstacle relating to faith. So in 2001, around the time of the horrific terrorist attacks on 9-11, most Muslims around the United States were portrayed as bad people or terrorists and people who should not be trusted. One night, I was with my friend and her mother inside of their home. I was friends with her for a very, very long time. And while we were eating at the dinner table, her mother asked me, do Muslims have to kill a Christian in order to make it to heaven? That question shocked me because I've known her and her mother for such a long time, I wasn't expecting that. I felt like I was family to them, but at that moment, I felt like I was a stranger. I had, examined, I had explained to them that the Muslim religion is full of kind-hearted, peaceful, and loving people. I told her that even though one person does something and I am a part of that group, group's religion, race, or background, that doesn't mean I am that person. I am different. I explained to her how the Muslim religion was my guidance in life and a way for me to feel inner and outer peace. The Muslim religion has guided me to be the person who I am today, and it helps me to find my inner, and outer peace and love. My name is Samara Lee, and this is my story about an obstacle relating to my faith. Well, thank you, Samar. Um, and my name is Kareem Majid, and I'm a senior living in the Bronx. And this is a story about a time when I experienced violence, and it was actually quite recent. It was this summer, just last month, 
beginning of August. And I live in a neighborhood that's a great neighborhood. It's really fun. I love my neighbors. Um, there's, there's lots of activity. There's lots of action. Um, but recently, two doors down, um, there's been this trap house, which um, has suddenly appeared with a bunch of people anywhere from the age, ages of 14 to 24 that are coming in and out of the trap house, not doing great things. Um, and I've been, and I've been scared, um, about, about my own safety, um, living just two doors down from this trap house. Uh, and one night in early August, again, just last month, after playing basketball, I went inside to take a shower afterwards. And after I, pl after playing basketball with my friends, um, and I suddenly heard, um, shots outside. Um, and I thought that they might be fireworks because there have been a lot of fireworks going off uh, since May um, in our neighborhood. So I thought, oh, they're just getting rowdy around fireworks again. But then I heard a scream. And then I heard tires screeching as if somebody was quickly trying to get away. And the screaming didn't stop. And that's when I realized in that moment in the shower that someone had been shot. So I quickly dried off and I went outside and well, actually I, I left, the, I went out of the shower and I didn't go outside yet. And I was looking through the windows and I started hearing sirens coming on their way and an ambulance following those police sirens. And then I realized that since the police were there that it was perhaps safe enough for me to go outside. So I went outside and there was blood everywhere. And I just, I just stood there in shock looking at this blood everywhere, wondering if the man was alive or not. And I saw actually his body being placed into the ambulance and I realized that he was alive um, and that I, he had actually been shot in the lungs and his lungs had been punctured. And I had heard those four shots and one of those shots, one of those four shots went into his lungs. And he, he was taken away and we don't know if the person who shot him has been caught or not. And what I have heard and what I do know is that although that man who was shot in the lungs is still alive, he is still in the hospital in the ICU and we don't know if he will actually make it. And what is sad about this is that since that night, the cops have finally started paying attention to our neighborhood. They've started, they finally have started caring about what goes on in our neighborhood. And now our neighborhood has been quiet since those four gunshots in early August. My name is Kareem Majid, and that's been my latest experience with violence. And now I'd like to tell you a story about my relationship with my faith. And I'm a part of the Muslim religion, although I grow up and, I, and I've grown up and I continue to grow up in a mixed religious household. My mom's a Christian, my dad, my stepdad's a Christian, but my dad's a Muslim and I'm a Muslim. And growing up in America, for me, it oftentimes feels like it's a sport to put my religion down. And yes, I live in the Bronx, but still, it just feels as if it's a favorite pastime of people. But I, growing up had a, in grade school, had a friend of mine who I always felt understood me and that we, that we understood each other and that it didn't matter about our race, religion, or anything like that, that what just mattered between us was that we were friends and that we, and that we bonded regardless of all of those different things. But in the, second, in the seventh grade, that same friend of mine who had never brought up a race or religion with me before sudden, suddenly started saying, why do you gotta be Muslim for? Why do you have to choose that religion? I asked him, do you have a problem with my religion? And then he said to the entire class as he pointed at me, hey everybody, look at Usama Karim, watch out. He might try to blow us all up. I couldn't believe that this was coming from my best friend in the seventh grade. I was so upset and I was confused. I stopped talking to him after I told him, you know what, not all Muslims are terrorists. And I let three months go by. And it was then that I decided that I should talk to him again. After all, we'd been friends for a really long time. And so I told him after those three months that went by, I said, hey man, you know, you embarrassed me and you hurt me. And not all Muslims are terrorists. And you know, there are over a billion people in the world that are Muslims. And I don't know why you've got to be like that. I don't know why you've got to look at me like that. And I asked him to be kind hearted 
to be a kind-hearted person, and to be respectful of everybody, regardless if they practiced a religion or they didn't practice a religion. I told him about how I grew up, and I grew up in a mixed religious house. So we decided to be friends again, but on new terms, on terms where we respected each other, on, regardless of all of those different things that going on. And over time, um, we, our bond came back, and what was cool about it all is that we're now in the same high school. And, and we've been friends since then for six more years. And I've seen him change. He is a better person because of that moment. And I'm a better person too. And it's, it's that thing where you realize that religion is deeply personal and um, it doesn't have to be something that everybody else has to um, experience with you. We just have to respect each other. It's really all about the person and there's no need to judge a person because of their religion or race. My name is Kareem Majid, and that's my story. So um, I would love to invite Katie and Greg to come back and join us on camera. Thank you, Katie and Greg, and thank you, thank you, Samar um, and Kareem. <laughs> and I'm going to go back now to being um, Samar and Kareem. Um, would you like to go back to being yourself? Yes, I'd like to be back to my. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're gonna return back to ourselves and to the to the names that are on screen, um, and let's we're gonna spend the next five minutes before we open it up um, to the audience to talk about what this experience was like and what went on these past few days to get us to what you all just witnessed us do. So, Greg, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, no, I've done a number of story exchanges. I think it's um it's a really great experience to connect with someone. So Katie and I exchanged stories last Friday. Um, and I've known Katie for a number of years um, through her involvement with Narrative 4. Um, so we've never exchanged stories, had a very in-depth conversation. But now I feel very connected um, to Katie by the fact that like I have this really personal story from her, which I'm sure I got a lot of the details wrong and things like that, but I feel you know that this is in a way my story now too. And similarly, listening to her tell my story, I think the most interesting point is that um, everybody receives a story differently. So it's you know it's not the way I told the story. And in fact, she picked up on things in the story that I'd never even thought about with the story and zeroed in on certain things and ignored others. Um, but that's the beauty of it is like we we tend to hear ourselves differently through the other person as we hold this new experience um, that they have too. So it, it's really beautiful. Yeah. Kareem, do you want to tell us about your experience telling someone else's story? Yes. Through this so, lens? Um, story exchanging is an amazing thing. Um, of course, like we just met each other and it feels like we've known each other for a very long time. And that's the beauty of story exchanges. You know, you meet someone, you don't know who they are, you don't know their background, whatever they've dealt with. But once you start that story exchange, as Greg said, it's like you're a part of them. It's like the story is yours now, that you share this story with this person. And now you share two important, very important stories with me. I feel like I am you now. I feel connected with you and I feel where you have come from and your struggles and your past. Yeah, thank you. And Katie? Yeah, so the story exchange with Greg was like r really awesome because I know first like we talked for like the first 30 minutes just catching up which is always nice. Um, and actually funny enough Greg and I like had a conversation around this time two years ago when like I had first met Caden and I just started a narrative four club at Craft, and I wanted him to really talk about like a, a little bit about like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and stuff like that and his telos group um and we had a conversation on the phone and like you know two years ago like I never would have thought we would be doing this exchange right now and now that conversation and stuff that he told like my narrative four club is just really clicking because like you know hearing his story firsthand of what it was like you know to be there and be in the moment um, so that was really awesome for me. And then also just hearing your story back, like Greg said, like hearing like bits and pieces that I never picked up on and bits and pieces like that I never would have gave a second thought to now, like I have that to process. And I think it revealed more about myself than 
I thought it would at first. And that's really an awesome thing to do is like self-reflect after an exchange. Definitely. I mean, for me, what's coming to mind right now is the word Ubuntu. Do you all know what Ubuntu means? Kareem, Katie, have you heard of the word Ubuntu? Um, so Ubuntu is a Kosan word um, from South Africa, and it means I am me because of you. You are you because of me. As I'm, as I'm witnessing this and I'm hearing everyone here talk about what these telling each other's stories made you feel, and I and myself experiencing it, we just experienced Ubuntu. That was it. Um, and walking in each other's shoes and caring about what that experience is like. And for me, Kareem, the, when the first five minutes when we were exchanging stories over the weekend, one of the things that you said to me is, and I here I am, the Southern woman in the South, um, and live, you know, living in Nashville, Tennessee, you said, you know what a trap house is? Do you know what a trap house um, in the Bronx is? And you started telling me about this and it was, it would just, it just, I was there with you. And suddenly, even though um, it's not really that safe for us to travel <laughs> at this moment, I felt like I had traveled those, um, those that, that, I don't know how, what the mileage is between here and the, in, in the Bronx, I should know this, but you know, I traveled all that way and I was there with you. And I traveled back to that night with you um, in early August and I was worried for you. And I was thinking about what must this be like? And suddenly it almost felt as if I was experiencing it with you. And as I was putting your story together today and I was thinking about it and walking in Kareem's shoes, um, I just kept thinking to myself, well, this is a really brave um, person and that I feel and I'm honored to know and that, and that he's trusted me with his story to tell. And I just, take, I just took it very seriously. Um, and it's one that I'll, uh, I'll never forget. And it's also created this bond. And I was also thinking, you know, Kareem Majid is a name that I'll never forget. And um, the next part of our program here is for Kareem and Katie um, to tell us about their experience in general with Narrative 4 and the Narrative 4 field exchange because they've done a few story exchanges. Katie, I don't know how many you've done, but I do know that Kareem shared with me that, th that he's in his, in his it, even though he's 17 years old and he turned 17 in March, um, he's in his 20s as it relates to <laughs> Narrative 4 story exchanges. This was 20 something for him. And so please, can you guys take a few minutes to share with us um, about your experience with the Narrative 4 field exchange program? And were there any new or surprising insights in this latest iteration? Katie, you wanna go first? Sure, so I've been involved with Narrative 4 for about four years now, which is crazy just saying that out loud. Um, so I got involved like my freshman year of high school and like I just really fell in love with the story exchange, which I'm hoping that all of you at home today has as well. Um, but just really the idea of that I'm so much bigger than myself. I can make connections all around the world. Um, and through Narrative 4, you know, I have friends like, you know, Kareem in the Bronx. Like, um, it's kind of sad. But like I know like probably more people from University Heights High School than I do in my own like little small um, high school in Floyd County, Kentucky. And that's crazy. And I never would have been able to say that had it not been for Narrative 4. Um, and just like for me personally, like just really diving into the field exchange. I've been involved with it for the past since my freshman year. So the first time I ever done a story exchange was actually with some students from the Bronx. Um, you know, that was the Katie, first iteration. What was that like? <laughs> That was, so it was crazy at first because what we really talked about, like, in the biggest, like, I guess, moment that everybody took away from it was that, like, we, um, in my neighborhood, like Greg alluded to in my story, we're all, like, kind of, for, like, the sake of, or for the lack of the better term, vanilla, like, everybody kind of comes from the same background, um, and we were looking at, like, a um, like a classroom full of students who, you know, have been all across the world and come from different locations and live, have different like home lives and different settings and stuff like that. And I think that really opened up my classes eyes and minds, especially like to the connections that can be made. That first exchange was really about breaking down stereotypes. Cause I mean, we were talking about like, we asked them and we wanted like that very open and honest conversation. We were like, what was what did y'all expect before like we had this conversation and this exchange 
And, you know, it was just really nice to have that moment of vulnerability. And that's when I think about narrative for that's like always the first word that comes to the mind is us being vulnerable and being willing to share a piece of ourselves with others. Thank you, Kareem. So narrative four has been a big part of my life. Um, well, I joined, it's about to be a year now since I joined, um, but my first ever story exchange took place in sophomore year. And when I first did the story exchange, I never knew this girl. Um, I was partnered up with a girl. I never knew the girl, I never spoke to her. I never even realized she was in my school. So one day I, of course, narrative four came from Kentucky to the Bronx. And we had a story exchange, me and the girl. And for the first time, I, I never knew who she was. I felt connected. It felt like I knew her. It felt like I was her. And to this day, I, I'm, I'm still close to her. I still talk to her. And that's the beauty of Narrative 4. Narrative 4 is a way to build bonds and a way to connect to other people. And a great thing about Narrative 4, you get to meet new people. You get to meet amazing, great people, such as everyone in this call. Um, the people from Kentucky, when they when we all met up in Connecticut for a field exchange, we all spoke to each other and we connected on the first day. Uh, for the rest of the week, it felt like we were brothers and sisters, just hanging out, doing our thing, be, being a part of a great program. And when they had to leave, it brought tears to our eyes. It brought tears to everyone's eyes because it's like watching your brother go, go away to college or like watching his sister go away to college. So it was an amazing experience just Having, 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 being able to see them, being able to spend a week with them, and also meeting new people, and it, it's it's just a great experience. Just, um, and I'm glad to be a part of this program. That's great, Greg. Did you want to add anything? Um, not really. I mean, the one thing just listening to Katie and um, Kareem is just to highlight how amazing and phenomenal. Um, young people are who are so capable of visioning and executing really incredible plans um, for our world. And I think it's important to name that many organizations um, are reluctant to sort of equip and uh, meaningfully equip and just uh, um, allow young people to take roles of leadership, but look at the world that we've created and that we're giving to them. <laughs> I mean, it's it's, 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 pretty, it's a pretty stark reality that we're currently in. And so I, I think that one, by um, really f um, viewing young people differently and understanding their capacities and capabilities to lead and to vision and to build organizations, which so many alumni from Narrative 4 have done at very, very young organization, um, very young ages, um, and then get, equipping them to actually get to know each other through vehicles like the Story Exchange or millions of conversations programming, I think is actually really um, important. We're all focused on what's going to happen in, you know, 40 some odd days. Uh, but whatever way we cut it, uh, we're set up for many, many years of division and strife, um, re regardless. And so we've got yeah. to find ways that can, um, that can take us beyond this polarization. And I think the people that we need to look to as examples and leaders are, um, are on this call. And there's Kate Green. Absolutely, as usual, very well said. Um, well, on that note, we're going to open it up to the audience for questions. Um, and I see we've got a few here right now. So um, I'm going to start with the well, first question that we received from the audience, which is what's the value of sharing stories to make change? So, why? So, let me, let me rephrase it to maybe just a little bit for everybody, and that is. Um, what, what comes out, what are the values that come out of exchanging stories and how does that result in change making behavior? Um, I want to take a quick stab at that. I'm sure Katie and Kareem do too, but I think like story and empathy are just a the beginning. They're not the end. But by sharing stories, by inhabiting the stories of another, we can build empathy and empathy is absolutely critical to live in a world with difference, with people who are different than us, and to create common languages and systems of government and organizations and whatnot where we seek to embolden one another instead of to dim diminish the other. So I think it's a critical necessary element that allows us to connect to people in ways that facts and figures won't ever draw us in, but it's not the end. And so the, the, the end that we can see is what we do once we have that empathy, 
what we do once we're connected, what, what we decide to do with that, that new found expanded identity. Kareem, do you want to add to that? Yeah, Greg like literally took the words out of my mouth. Um, he, he explained like it, storytelling is not the end. It's just the beginning and like it just brings people closer. And that's like the main thing about storytelling. That's like how powerful this storytelling really is. Katie. Yeah, I'll piggyback off of both what Kareem and Greg said. And um, something that's like, especially what the value I take out of storytelling is. I mean, I grew up in the Appalachian Mill, so I grew up hearing stories. But the thing like different about this, where you're sharing personal stories with each other, is that it allows you to grow and it allows your mindset to like, not necessarily change, but to become more open. Um, and when, that's one of the beautiful things to me is especially like, as I kind of alluded to earlier, the first story exchange I did was with some students from the Bronx. And I just realized, you know, you have that mind moment of where you're like wow there's so I, story um, storytelling is so much bigger than myself and I feel like that's where you can really take things away from um you know everybody's story everybody's story has a lesson or a moral or something that you can pull out of it and I think that just maybe by taking that story and letting it change you and letting it alter your perspective is really the value of it because you can there's always room to grow and I think stories is stories allow that growth so I'm gonna, could I add a short poem? Yes. About the power of story. This is a poem that I love that I know Katie and Kareem have heard me say um, in New Orleans before, but it's from, um, it really highlights the power of, of story. Um, it's from Hafez, the uh, Sufi, the 12th century Sufi poet. And I'm paraphrasing, but it's something along the lines of, the fool builds cages for everyone he knows, while the sage, who has to drop his head when the moon hangs low, keeps dropping keys all night long for all the beautiful, rowdy prisoners. And why I offer that poem about story is because story is both cage and key. Story is what allows us to classify people as those people, as them, as less than human. Of those people just crazy, they're evil, they can be destroyed. But story is also the key that allows us to see for the possibility of a different way of organizing ourselves and to connect before we can sort through all the voluminous data and all of that stuff about how we like to think we're rational beings. So story is really important, it's both that thing that can be used to oppress us, to deny our humanity, but it's also the vehicle that can unleash that humanity. So beautiful. Thank you, Greg. And thanks for sharing that. And it's so true. And, and that's why when we start, I started off the call, I said one of the things that millions of conversations we aim to do is disrupt cycles of fear, hate, and violence. And what we found in our work is that that cycle that leads to the ugly stuff of fear, hate, and in some instances, violence, always starts with demonizing the other, labeling the other, taking a narrative and demonizing the other. So with what Greg is saying is exactly what we're doing here, which is changing the narrative, changing the narrative so that we humanize rather than demonize. Um, and for me, um, that's a key value in the story exchange process. And I would just say, um, and some people have heard me say this before and, and, and others who speak Arabic know this, but my name actually means um, a long conversation from sunset to sunrise. Um, and, and it's in many ways, it's about telling stories around a campfire from sunset to sunrise, from dusk until dawn. So um, I'm cheating a little bit in that. That was the, I think that um, my parents um, named me that on purpose. Um, and so being an Arab and a Southern woman, um, <laughs> like, uh, you know, we, I have learned to tell stories and that's how I were, that's how I relate into the world. And I think that that's how people in general relate to each other. Um, and that's also why I've become, um, really interested in understanding what social media and the internet are doing to that process of our 
um, hum, of our human exchange of how what we I don't know if we're designed to tell each other's stories in 250 characters or less. Um, and that I'll leave it that question at that. And maybe we can we can extend when we have more time to discuss and move to the next question, which is, what do you each consider the core of another person's story and your own story to be? Katie, I saw you react on that one. So do you want to go first? Yeah, I'm trying to think about it. I really like that question. Um, and I think when you really stop and think about it, like the core of a story, I think is um, what makes that person who they are today. Because I feel like yeah. every story, yeah. you know, contributes to who you are as a person. Because obviously like your experiences and stuff shifts you. So I really like that question just because it's a really thought-provoking question like you know what is the core of the story mm -hmm. um so I think that could really be broken down in a lot of different ways like maybe the core of your story is faith or maybe the core of my story might be violence like you know mm -hmm. you never really know what has altered that person mm -hmm. Kareem right um so like the core of like a story in my opinion is everything because everything that the person tells you matters everything that they tell you is for a reason it's not like they're going to leave a random detail or anything out if they want to tell you that something happened this day or something happened to them they're going to tell you and that's why i believe like everything in a story is like the core detail everything the, the whole story in general is like the core and it's just like you just taking pieces and pieces in and slowly building up and understanding them Greg? I'm not sure what to add on that. The only thing I'd say with the story exchange, which is interesting, is that it forces that question and it gives you insight on that question. So when I heard Katie's story, like I had to think about what does this story mean? Like what's, what's the purpose of this? And so that forced me to reorganize what she shared in a way that made sense to me. But in that process, I'm kind of her story is becoming part of my framework for understanding the world just as my framework is expanding. And similar, listening to the story back from Katie, she saw the story completely differently than I you know, had experienced it. And so it's really interesting to hear that because she was hearing something very differently that was sort of filtered through her experience. And so her core of the story was, was different than what I would have said the core of the story was until Katie just just shared it. So I, you know, I don't know the answer to that. I just know that it's, it's something that we're constantly working out um, and not just in story exchanges in real life. I mean, we don't, you know, life doesn't make sense if we can't fit it into a, a story. So we're always looking for that core. Absolutely. And I would say just to add for me, um, and I, everything I agree with everything that's been said, but in addition for me, um, and Lynn McFarland asked that question for me, it's I, I'm the core is also how the for me, how the person's feeling and how that experience made them feel and, and really trying to understand how it shaped them um, and 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 how they exist in the world. Um, so I really am like listening to tone um, and and words used. Um, like for example, uh, Kareem used the word, he embarrassed me. In essence, what Kareem was saying too is that his friend shamed him. When you shame somebody, that's a very powerful, almost like a weapon to use against someone is to shame them, to shame them for a choice that they have made or for who they are. And so that was the word that Kareem chose. Just, it just spontaneously came up when he described how it made him feel. And that, that for me was the core of Kareem's story. Um, and Kareem, we have a question from another person in our audience, which is they wanna know if my story influenced your experience of being a Muslim in America. Um, yeah, because like Samara's story, it, well, my story um, was an was an amazing story. Um, it showed like it, it doesn't matter like who who you are. Like if you believe in this, then 
you believe in this. Like you don't have to change for anybody. You don't have to. If someone if someone's a Christian and they want you to be a Christian and you want to be a Muslim, you don't gotta change for that person. You could just be yourself. If if you identify as a Muslim or um, a person, an African American or a Guyanese person, which I am, like don't let anybody change your roots or wherever you come from or your beliefs. So yeah, this her story did like have an impact on me showed that like even though she she got threatened that like people wanted her to not be on this earth anymore it showed like (laughs) even though she didn't change who she was she explained who she was thank you kareem and this is for katie and kareem we have another question which is why did you get involved with this work specifically this is work that energizes you why there's and there's so many options when you're in high school why choose narrative four? Why choose story exchange? So, um, like, as I said, like in, in sophomore year, I had a story exchange. Um, the Kentucky kids came to the Bronx and we had a story exchange. And when I had that story exchange, it, it made me realize like I can meet so many people in this world that, that have like, that I can learn from, that I can, um, that they can give me advice. I can give them advice. And like over time, when I became a junior and I got more involved in narrative four, I was able to like speak to everyone and everyone is telling me how like amazing of a program it was. So I said, I wanted to figure it out myself. So I ended up doing it and whatever the rumors were, they were true that everything that uh, all the storytelling and how you connect with people and meet new people and like it changes you as a person. It, it, that's why I chose this path on being a, a narrative four ambassador. Katie? It's actually kind of funny, like thinking back to it now. Um, so I actually got involved in Narrative 4 because it was the assignment for pre-AP English. Because at first when um, my teacher, Mary Sloan, which I'm not for sure if some of y'all know her or not, but she mentioned to me, she was like, we're going to do the story exchange for class. And she was explaining it to me. And she was like, it's life changing. And honestly, when she first said that, like, I was like, oh, you're just saying that, so I'll do it. So, like, you know, I'll put my best in and get an A. I never dreamed, like, all the opportunities and doors that would be open because of narrative for it. Like, I never, like, you know, four years ago, maybe five, oh, my goodness. Um, But, you know, when I first got involved, I was just kind of, you know, I was like, eh, it seems cool, we'll do it in class, and then that'll be the end of it. No, narrative four is like really like shaped me as a person. And that's why it's so exciting once you go through that first story exchange, because like you realize like, wow, you know, I have the power to change the world. And I always laugh um, at Lisa Consiglio and Colin McCann. I always tell them to give me the big head because everybody in narrative four is so, you know, open minded and so like empowered for change that they'll tell you you can change the world and they'll give you the tools to do it. And that's just that. my first <laughs> I love that. Thank you, Katie. Can you all hear me? Okay, Katie, we lost you for that last two two seconds. Oh, okay, sorry. I'm on um, campus Wi-Fi, so. No, you're doing great, Wi-Fi. you're doing great. Just the last two seconds, <laughs> but that was, uh, we feel your energy coming, honestly, coming across the virtual space, so. It's awesome. Um, And we have um, just a couple of last questions here. Um, And what uh, the question is, one of the last questions is, do you feel reading each other's tales is crucial um, to establishing empathy? I'll answer quickly, no, but it's so helpful. I know it seems like such a simple exercise. I'd love to hear some of it because this was your first story exchange. But the second that you take a story that's meaningful to someone else and then have to retell it in the first person, something changes. It's not just listening to their story anymore. It's like, oh, I have to be accountable to this person for this significant moment in their life. And then you have to start imagining what it was really like for them. And it's so different than just watching a film or reading a book or even having someone tell you their story, having to repeat it and to do it with that care and that responsibility of getting it right just is another experience of empathy, but it's certainly not the only one. Yeah, so this was my first story exchange and I can't wait to do another one. Um, And so I I really found it to be powerful um, for, for many reasons. I appreciated that it also 
made me, it disrupted my own routine, you know, and in a, in a very good way. Um, and I trusted the process and I love meeting new people as well. And I really enjoyed meeting Kareem. Um, and I enjoy the process of forming a bond with, with someone um, and, and stepping in their shoes. And, and so for, for me, one of the first things I do always when I meet a new person is if we have time is to ask them, tell me your story. Um, and, and so I, obviously there are other ways to build empathy, but I think that this is one of the critical ways of, of how we do it. Um, and, and, and one of the things we have to do as people is to invest the time, you know, we have to invest the, the time that's required to listen. Um, to, and in a conversation, like lots of times when we say we're millions of conversations, people will, I, it's interesting because people will say, oh, that's really cool, millions of voices. And so when I'm saying millions of conversations, they're hearing millions of voices. And we purposely use the word conversation because conversation goes both ways. You know, conversations between two or more people, unless you're talking to yourself. Um, but, you know, but, and, but the conversation piece of having a conversation with one or more people requires um, active listening. And usually once you've had someone who you've listened to and they've really truly listened to you, then they also then will trust, you are building trust with each other and they will start telling you their story too. And that, and then you connect. So um, I just, we have, we have uh, two minutes left and I wanted to give the final word to um, my esteemed co-panelists. And the final word is what would you like to, we have, um, we have a, as, as um, Greg alluded to, you know, we are in the, uh, we are in 2020. Let me just leave it at that. <laughs> We are all in, we are all in 2020. Um, what would you like your final word to be to our audience? Um, um, and what I mean by final word is what words of wisdom would you like to impart on our audience members on um, how to coexist in the fourth quarter of 2020 in the most productive ways possible? Greg? Okay, Kareem. <laughs> so to hold on on this fourth quarter of uh, 2020, stay positive, uh, think positive and um, just make sure whatever happens, try to stay positive. Um, you know, if you have anybody at home, you can start up a story exchange with them and you could tell the story that they said back to them and maybe you might learn something new. Maybe you learn, every day you learn something new. So uh, if anybody's in school, just focus on school, work, um, make sure you guys stay safe. And uh, of course, like always stay productive and always move forward. Katie? I guess my parting thoughts are, you know, stay positive, stay healthy and sign up for some story exchanges. We have some awesome exchanges coming up and I think everybody should experience this at least yes. once. So make sure to sign up. Um, that, that's my words of wisdom. Um, Samar, that's a tough question. I'll, I'll give a couple succinct points. One, brace yourself for the long haul. So no matter what happens 40 days from now, what, no matter what side of this you're on, um, this is something that we ha will be navigating for many months and many years in ways that we cannot fully understand. But to put some perspective on it. So the world has been through so many seemingly impossible moments before, and I hope we're not heading back to that level of destruction. So I don't wanna reference anything specifically, but if you know any history, you go back, the world has been much more unstable many times before than it currently is. And three, in this moment and in future moments, we have agency unlike people have ever had before. And part of that agency means getting uncomfortable. It means that if things are happening that we don't understand, one of the things that we can do is learn how to deeply listen. And that's not an inaction, that's a key action for us to actually figure out how to get through this mess together and figure out who else is willing to risk to help us get to a better place that works for everyone, not just a few of us. So I think 
I think this is a critical period for us, but ultimately I'm hopeful. The last thought there is there's a, a friend of mine in Bethlehem. He has a, a, a great catchphrase about hope. It's not, a, it's not a noun or an emotion. Hope is what you do. It's an action. So be hopeful. And my final word would be Ubuntu. I am me because of you. You are you because of me. Let's, let's stay strong together. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kareem. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Narrative 4. And thank you, the Millions of Conversations team as well. Um, we love you and good night. <laughs>